As I said, uh, we'll be focusing on Matthew chapter 25, where Jesus speaks to his disciples about that last day when he will come to judge. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, he will sit on his throne in heavenly glory. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate the people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my Father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. I needed clothes, and you clothed me. I was sick and you looked after me. I was in prison and you came to visit me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you? Or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in? Or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and go to visit you? The king will reply, I tell you the truth. Whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers of mine, you did for me. Then he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you who are cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger and you did not invite me in. I needed clothes and you did not clothe me. I was sick and in prison, and you did not look after me. They also will answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or needing clothes or sick or in prison and did not help you? He will reply, I tell you the truth. Whatever you did not do for one of the least of these, you did not do for me. Then they will go away to eternal punishment but the righteous to eternal life. This is the gospel of our Lord. I already talked a little with the children about this as they came up, but how invested did you get in the Olympics this past week? Were you you watching every night? Were you glued to the TV to see what was going to happen? One of the highlights of the Summer Olympic Games is gymnastics. And whether it is men or women who are performing and competing, it's amazing to me. I am astonished by the acrobatic things that they can do with such power and yet also such control and balance. And maybe it's just astonishing to me so much because I know that if I were to try to do any of that, I would fall flat on my face immediately. But it's just incredible. And one of the unique things about gymnastics is that it's not a head-to-head competition like many of the others are. You, You don't win by crossing the line first as you're running or touching the end of the pool first. You you don't win by getting the most points or goals or runs like you do in basketball, or soccer, or softball. No, in gymnastics, you are judged. And the judges are strict. They show very little mercy. I mean, when I watch the gymnastics, I mean, there's some errors that I can see, but many of the ones that the judges see I don't notice at all. In fact, to to be a judge for gymnastics, you would would need to know exactly what perfection really looked like. And because they're being judged, they're being watched, every single move that they make, I think that it could bring on a lot of very intense pressure. Pressure to perform. 
In fact, this last week, we, we saw that pressure, right? Simone Biles, one of the elite gymnasts in the world, and, and I believe she actually comes from around the Houston area. That's where she grew up. She stepped out of the competition because of some of that pressure, that intense pressure that gets put on them to perform perfectly because they will be judged. When you think about your life, when you think about the future, do you recognize that you will be judged? The creed reminds us of that today as we continue to walk through the phrases of this creed. It reminds us that Jesus will come back. He will come to judge the living and the dead. And that thought that we are going to be judged, that might bring intense pressure on our own lives and on our own hearts. We direct our eyes to this future event that absolutely will happen. Everything else that we've talked about in the creed has already happened. This is something that's coming in the future, and it reminds us of how we started when we first began to look at the Apostles' Creed, that we begin and we say, I believe. Not, I know, right? We believe that Jesus will come to judge the living and the dead. We don't know all the details. We don't know all of the specifics. But those details and those specifics that God does give to us in his word, they should form and shape our lives moving forward. And as we think about judgment, that intense pressure might be there. But as we gain clarity and symmetry from the creed this morning, it's going to help us to stand confident in this judgment. It's going to help us to stand confident as we place our faith and trust in Jesus, our Savior, so that we will not buckle under the pressure. And as we look at Jesus' words of truth today, they're going to help us again to, to push back against narratives that can get into our minds. They're, they're going to help us to push back, first of all, against self-righteousness. This thought that every single thing that I do, it matters exponentially. But they're also going to help us to push back against fatalism. The idea that nothing I do matters. That it's all just determined ahead of time. My destiny is my destiny. And what I do doesn't matter at all. The creed will help us to push back against both of those. And so as last week we got to witness Jesus' ascension up into heaven, this week the creed reminds us that Jesus will come back again. And we hear Jesus' description of that event in Matthew chapter 25. In fact, Jesus had brought it up. The entire chapter of Matthew 25 has to deal with the end. Jesus brought it up when the disciples were marveling at the, the high, impressive, beautiful buildings in the city of Jerusalem. And Jesus reminded them that at the end, someday, not a single stone would be left on top of another. And then he used parables to encourage them to be prepared at all times. And finally, he used the illustration he taught with the parable that we heard this morning. And Jesus will come back. He will come back as a king, and no one will dispute his reign or his rule. He will come back in all of his glory with all his angels accompanying him. No longer will he speak to just a small group of followers on a hillside. No longer will his church fight against the rising tide of culture. No, Jesus will come to judge the living and the dead. He will separate all peoples like a shepherd separates the sheep and the goats. Do you understand that illustration? I don't. <laughs> I've never really worked closely with 
goats and sheep. I don't know if you have, um, but I never have. I did this past this summer when we traveled up to Wisconsin for a vacation. We went to LeClaire Family Creamery. It's a, a cheese factory in uh, Wisconsin there, and they specialize in goat cheese. And so they had a goat farm, and you can actually walk out, and you can see some of the goats, and they also had some sheep there as well. And as you look at goats and sheep, and, and, and you see those two animals, they're not really all that different from each other. If I saw a whole bunch of sheep and goats on a hillside far off in the distance, I wouldn't be able to tell them apart. And in Jesus' time, Middle Eastern shepherds, they often would herd goats and sheep together, and and they'd only separate them if it became necessary. As we live this life right now, as we live in the world, God's people, believers, and those people of the world, we... As much as we think that there are things that divide and separate us, as much as we talk about the the barriers that are there because of race or ethnicity or culture or our our political bent or, or whatever it might be that we say separates us, language barriers, nationalities, really, we're not all that different from one another. And yet when Jesus comes to judge... There is something that distinguishes us. There is something that makes us different, and Jesus will judge based on that difference. Some will be among the sheep of Jesus' fold, and others will be among the goats. And as you notice that Jesus makes this separation as that king, as that shepherd who comes, he makes no mistakes. There's no one standing there and saying, "Um, Jesus, you put me with the goats. I'm really supposed to be over there with the sheep, right? He makes no mistakes. His judgment is perfect. I think that that leads us naturally to ask a question, a really important question, on which side will I stand? Will I be on the right side? With Jesus' sheep among his flock? Will will I be on the left uh, among the goats? And I want to be on the right. I want to be with Jesus' sheep. So how will I make sure that I'm standing over there? And even as believers, I think it's easy for us to believe that that distinction, it comes because of the things that we do. And so we'll ask, have I done enough good in my life? Have, have I fed enough hungry people? Have I given clothing to enough people who were in need? Have I been generous enough with my time and my service and my finances? And Jesus himself talks about all of those things. But the clarity that the creed brings to us today is to understand that Jesus' judgment is both just and merciful. Now I want you to look really closely at the words that Jesus says to those who are on his right. The words that bring us this incredible clarity, the words that our King Jesus says to us, the King will say to those on his right, come, come, You who are blessed by my Father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. Those words are incredibly merciful. And I just want to highlight several of them so you can see the mercy of our Savior Jesus, the mercy that really then helps us to push back against any thought of self-righteousness. First of all, Jesus says, come. That's That's an invitation. An invitation is not something that you earn. It is something extended to you. It is a gift And Jesus says, come and take your 
inheritance. An inheritance is not something that is earned. It is a gift. To be with our gracious, compassionate God for all eternity, it is a gift. Jesus says, you are blessed by my Father. You have the favor of God. And blessings are not earned. Blessings are not deserved. Blessings also are gifts freely given to be freely received. And this blessing and this inheritance, what Jesus invites us to come and take, it is a kingdom. And notice what Jesus says about that kingdom. It was a kingdom that was prepared for you since the creation of the world. God always had this incredible, beautiful plan to rescue and save you. God has graciously come into your life and he has brought the good news of that plan, the good news of your Savior Jesus. He has mercifully sent his Holy Spirit into your hearts to bring you to faith and trust in that incredible plan. This well-prepared, well-executed plan the plan that the creed talks about. That God sent His own Son, Jesus, who was born of Mary, who suffered, who died, who was buried, who, who rose again from the dead, who ascended into heaven. That was this beautifully executed plan, perfectly executed plan. And that plan was fulfilled by Jesus. Not you. Jesus perfectly executed that plan in your place. And it is all yours by his mercy so that you can be restored to what God always intended for you, his creation. You can be that glorious, joy-filled crown of God's creation it's not based on the mental tally marks that we can rack up in our minds of our life of faith. But to have the confidence and joy in this judgment, it is based on Jesus' mercy. And it is so important that we rebel against self-righteousness and anything that would say that it's about what I have done. But just as we rebel against self-righteousness, we also rebel against fatalism. Because God's mercy will not be without effect. Actions will flow forth. That's what Jesus says. He says, for I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you invited me in. I needed clothes and you clothed me. I was sick and you looked after me. I was in prison and you came to visit me. And those are not the qualifications for heaven's entrance exam. But they do demonstrate the faith that is in our hearts. The faith and trust that will flow forth in service to others. And again, we see God's mercy. Because our merciful God is pleased in those actions. He is pleased by the, the little things that we do in his name and out of love and service to him, those actions matter. And so we reject fatalism, we reject self-righteousness because of Jesus' mercy, but we also reject self-righteousness because Jesus is not only a merciful judge, but he is also a just judge. To his left stand those who have rejected Jesus' mercy, who have scorned his cross, his grace that he has extended. And they're surprised. 
You know, they ask, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or in prison? And Jesus answers that whatever they didn't do for the least of these, they didn't do for him. I think it's really important for us to recognize that. As we reflect on how God's people and the people of the world, how we all live, mingle together, sometimes not only do we look the same, but sometimes we also act the same. And so I think that's, that's part of the surprise that they have, that they felt in their life, no, I, I have done good things. I, I, I have helped people. I have given to the poor. I, I, I've fed the hungry. But Jesus reminds us that without faith in our hearts, without the mercy of God being extended to us, again and again, such actions do not please our God. Those who have rejected Jesus will depart. And this is where we can gain a really important symmetry, a balance in our life of faith. And it's a symmetry and a balance that our world really struggles with because our world wants to be either all mercy or all justice. And it really struggles to imagine how the two of those, how they can exist together, how they can stand as one. And we sometimes struggle with that as well. We want to see justice. We want to see justice carried out, and and that's good. God wants justice too. We, we want to see sin punished. And again, that good God wants to see sin punished as well. But sometimes we take pleasure in that punishment. But not our God. Our God takes no pleasure in the death of of the wicked. Our God takes no pleasure in punishment for wickedness and rebellion. He is a just God, and so he will carry out that punishment, but he takes absolutely no pleasure in it. He would rather that they turn from their wickedness, that they turn in repentance to God and know his mercy, know his forgiveness. You see, God's heart is so much bigger than our own, right? Because God can both desire justice and at the same time extend mercy. And we want to take on that heart of God. His desire is for more sheep than goats. And you look at the language there that Jesus uses, even as he sends them away, he says, Depart from me, you who are cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. Hell was prepared as a prison for Satan and the evil angels who rebelled against God. It was not prepared for man. It was not part of God's perfectly executed plan for humankind. God is not fatalistic. He's not arbitrarily decided that some will be in heaven and and others will be in hell. No, he desires to extend mercy. There is not a single person to whom God has not said, I want you in my kingdom. But sadly, there are many who have turned to God and said, I do not want to be in your kingdom. And that is where our rejection of fatalism becomes so important because our actions matter. Our witness matters. They do make an impact. And your actions can make an eternal impact in the life of another so that they can be covered by the mercy of Jesus. 
Let's take on the heart of our God. That big heart that can desire justice, but also extend mercy. Let's take on that heart of our God and in our counsel to one another. Let's encourage one another to witness boldly to the mercy and grace of our Savior, Jesus Christ. And I think it's amazing as you think about this judgment, as you think about the picture that Jesus paints, all nations gather together. In this judgment, we are surrounded by incredible diversity. Right? All the nations, all the things that we feel like separate us today. It doesn't matter then. Language, culture, race, all those things that, that draw these dividing lines And I want you to think right now, just imagine how we as a church, how you individually, how you could cross over those lines of division. And you could make what's going to be a future reality, how you can make that a present reality right now. Through your witness, through extending mercy, through getting to know others. What a powerful confession that we can make when we take on the heart of God. And there's this amazing correlation between those acts of faith that Jesus talks about and our witness. Because isn't it those acts of our faith, when we show love and we show kindness, when we serve others, when we give generously, aren't those the very things that open up our opportunities to witness? And they're very very simple acts. They're not large and extraordinary things that Jesus calls us to do. They're they're simple acts of kindness and grace. Let's encourage one another towards those simple acts. And the more that we carry forth those simple acts, the more that we're going to have opportunity to extend the mercy of God, and I think the more the large and extraordinary will take place in our lives. And we can celebrate it. Olympic gymnasts want to stand on the podium all by themselves. All alone. But not God's people. Oh, we want to stand surrounded by so many from all over the world. We want to stand surrounded by all the sheep in Jesus' flock to celebrate our King and His incredible mercy. That a mercy that takes all the pressure off as you consider how Jesus, our King, will come to judge the living and the dead. Amen.